Yeah, it's a pleasure to have Daniel today from Perimeter <laughs> Institute, and he will talk about ultra how to probe ultralight bosons with uh, stellar events. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for organizing this workshop to the local organizers and where is connected on Zoom for the organizers. So today I want to tell you about some uh, about a very exciting new idea that uh, we have together with my collaborators shown here on how to probe ultralight bosons using an astrophysical process, which is the process of disrupting stars near supermassive black holes that exist in the center of galaxies. So let me start by just giving you the very broad, big picture idea of our proposal. So first of all, stellar TDs are probably processes that you're not very familiar with, but they are standard processes that happen astrophysically in, in all galaxies. They are essentially the disruption of a star that passes very close to the supermassive black hole that exists in most of uh, in the center of most galaxies. The star passes by close to, stars can pass by very close to this black hole, and due to the strong tidal forces that they feel from the gravitational potential of the black hole, they can get ripped apart and they can just turn into a stream of gas. Now, stellar TDs happen when stars approach the black hole very closely, so they happen very near the horizon. Therefore, the rate for this process to happen depends very sensitively on the near horizon geometry. And as we know very well from elementary general relativity, the near horizon geometry is affected by the spin of the black hole. Therefore, the rate for the stellar TDs to happen does depend very sensitively on the spin of the supermassive black holes. Now, the connection with BSM physics arises because it's known that if new light bosons exist in nature, they can extract spin from black holes very effectively by a process that's called the supervariant instability. Therefore, given that stellar TD rates depend on black hole spin and that black hole spins can be severely affected by the existence of new ultralight bosons in nature, then we can draw a connection between measurements of stellar TD rates, which are performed in, in observatories and the existence of ultralight bosons. By exploiting this connection, we can actually try to discover or set limits on these particles, okay? So in order to make this all much more quantitative, I will need to tell you many more details about what are stellar TDs. Uh, we will need to review the process of black hole supervariance. And once we do that, we'll be able to draw this connection and see what is the, um, what, what can we do with, this, with these events. So let's start with uh, uh, the basics of stellar TDs, okay? So as I already told you, stellar TDs is the disruption of stars near supermassive black holes that happen in the center of galaxies. So how close do these stars need to pass from the black hole in order for them to be disrupted? They need to pass within a tidal radius where the tidal radius is a quantity that can be calculated. In Newtonian physics, it can be calculated pretty simply. And it turns out, it turns out to, well, it depends of course on the properties of the star and on the properties of the black hole. So it depends on the radius of the star, the mass of the black hole and the mass of the star. And if you plug in typical numbers here for supermassive black holes and for properties of main sequence stars, you get that the tidal radius of, is of the order of 10 to the minus six parsecs. For a supermassive black hole of the order of 10 to the six solar masses, this tidal radius is roughly 20 times the horizon radius. So this is a near horizon quantity. So this is telling you that stellar TDs do happen very close to the horizon. Now, the observable effect of a stellar TD is that once you disrupt the star, you have all this gas that accretes into the black hole and that leads to a very, very bright flare. So this is shown here in the snapshots from simulations that, are, that have been done by, by these uh, authors here. So these are nine snapshots in time on how does a stellar TD happen. So here in the center, you have the supermassive black hole. You cannot see it very well, but there's a circle there, which is the tidal radius. And this tiny dot here is just a star that it's approaching the black hole. It enters into the tidal radius and it's starting to get disrupted. As the time passes by, the star gets more and more disrupted and the gas gets elongated. And, and it ends up following the elliptical orbit that the star had to begin with. So as the process keeps going on, this elliptical orbit starts processing because of GR effects. So this gas starts intersecting itself. And as it does that, it releases energy and it circularizes. It forms an accretion disk around the black hole. And from there, the gas accretes into the black hole and emits a large amount of light. Of light. So this, this leads to a gigantic flare, okay? 
This light curve here is showing you how this flare looks like in time. So the luminosity that is expected from these flares is to be of, the, it's, it's roughly of the order of the EV Eddington luminosity. So these are events that are, can be Eddington, Super Eddington or Sub Eddington, but they are usually events that have luminosities, black body luminosities, which are close to Eddington. So they are really, really bright. And in time, these light curves look as follows. So this is the light curve as a function of the magnitude that you observe in a particular optical survey for these TDEs. And this is the time, okay? So you see that there's a very sharp rise of the magnitude of this event, and then it decreases very smoothly over time. So here I'm showing you roughly three optically selected TDs, okay? Now the status of these uh, TD observations has, are that now we roughly have a few dozen TDs selected in the X-ray spectra, a few dozen TDs selected in the optical spectra, and a few TDs are selected in the UV spectra. So this is the radiation that you can expect from, from these uh, events. And the observed TDE rates um, that have been extracted from data in, in surveys is of the order of roughly 10 to the minus four events per galaxy per year. So if you count the number of galaxies in the sky and you multiply this number and for, a, for an observation that is a few years, you can actually already noticed that you can have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of TDEs that happen around us. However, these TDE rates are still smaller than the rates for other transient events that happen in the sky, such as supernovas. Supernovas have rates that are roughly a factor of 10 larger than this. Therefore, you should be skeptical because that, yet that you can actually distinguish these events. These events are just flares that are very, very bright, but there are other things that are flares on the sky that are also bright, such as supernovas or AGNs that have variability. So you, you must be skeptical that the events that you're looking in the sky are actually TDs. But actually there are several handles that you have in order to distinguish TDs from other transit events such as supernovas and, and AGNs, et cetera. So let's review some of these handles so that I convince you that these events are actually some, something that you can you can detect and you can count. So the first few properties, of course, is that TDs are bright, as I already told you. They are transient. They roughly last for a year, and they have a peak time that is roughly 50 days, OK? So this you see from the light curve that I, that I already showed you. This behavior was predicted. So there was a paper in the 80s by Martin Rees that actually predicted not only the typical luminosity of the TDs, but also that the fall of this uh, light curve was time to the minus five thirds, which is exactly what is observed in data in some of these selected events. In some other events, it's not exactly that, but it's remarkable that this, this, um, this actual, this, these light curves were predicted theoretically, okay? Now, other handles that you have is that the decay in time is extremely smooth. So in this plot, I'm showing you the power index of this decaying time. So if this, the decaying time is t to a power, here I'm showing you the power, and these dots are optically selected TDs. So you see that this power doesn't change much in time. So this is telling you that the decay is actually t to a power. So it's a very smooth decay. I'm confronting that with the typical power index of other types of events, which are flaring AGNs, which is another type of transient events in colors in the back. And you see that for, for flaring AGNs, the change in the slope is extremely pronounced. So you see that while TDEs are very smooth events, other transient events that you see in the sky are not smooth. They are very stochastical in time. So that gives you a handle to distinguish TDEs from flaring AGNs or, um, or AGNs that have variabilities. Moreover, TDEs are selected only in galaxies that do not have constant AGNs. And the reason is that we don't want to uh, mix them with AGNs. Therefore, when you make an observation, you have to make sure to mask out all the galaxies that actually have AGNs or have any history of being an AGN in the past, in the near past. In order to distinguish TDs for superno from supernovas, you have other handles. One of the most important handles is that is the behavior of color as a function of time. Supernovas are well known to have very variable colors as time evolves. So these three lines here are showing you the color evolution of typical supernovas as a function of time. And you see that the color gets a colder and colder as time passes by, while these curves here are showing you the color evolution of TDs. So it's very, very flat. So this is a handle that already tells you a way to distinguish TDs from supernovas. So after you use all these, these are, by the way, these are not the on, only handles. There's a very long list of handles that you can use to distinguish TDs from AGNs or from supernovas. What was the event that was, was the, at the opposite slope compared to the supernova? Is it something that's getting closer to the black hole or? This I, one here, 
yeah, the actually, one that grows up. Yeah, yeah, I don't know exactly what's this one. Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what's this one. But it definitely doesn't decay in time. So there's no TD that I know of that the color it gets colder in time. Merging of lead giants or white, right? Mm -hmm. so how do you distinguish sharply your disruption from supernova events? Is it the absence of the black holes in supernova or? Well, I mean, you're, you're, you, you mean with respect to general supernovas or a particular class of supernovas? Uh, general supernova can, I mean, I, I was assuming that even this event could be included as uh, one of the supernova yes. explosion, but yeah. you, you sharply distinguish you cannot rough, exactly. That's why actually I'm, I'm, I'm being pedantic in showing you all these different handles. And the reason is that very well selected TDEs satisfy many of the criteria set by these handles. But there are events which are controversial, which they share some similarities with supernovas, and, uh, and then you cannot distinguish very well. Now, however, if you pick a certain amount of handles that you trust, and then you count how many TDs you have, you can check that the result that you get makes sense. So let me let me show you what I mean, okay? So it's true that in some cases you can mistake TDs for supernovas and vice versa, but if you, your set of handles is robust enough, then you can do cross checks that your final result makes sense. Okay, let, let, let me show you what I mean. What I mean. And this is, a, this is roughly what I mean. So the observed TD rate, once you speak a particular amount of handles is roughly 10 to the mi minus four events per galaxy per year. The expected TDE rate, which you can calculate from simulations, which you base, basically take black, black holes in the center of galaxies, you know what are the st stellar distributions in the galaxy roughly. So you take stars, you just put them in trajectories, you make sure how they evolve in time, et cetera, et cetera. And you can calculate what's the TDE rate. They calculated the TDE rate before the observed one was fixed to be 10 to the minus four from, from data was 10 to the minus four per galaxy per year. So the fact that your observation and the expectations are matching for the certain amount of handles that you chose to, be, to, to set a TDE, it's already evidence that you are getting most of the events at least to order one level, you are getting them right, okay? Moreover, not only you can do that, you can also plot TDE rates as a function of the mass of the black hole that led to the TDE, okay? So when you have a TDE in a galaxy, you, you roughly know what's the mass of the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy from measuring the bulk properties of the galaxy, for, in, for instance, M sigma. So you can then do a plot of TDE event rates as a function of supermassive black hole mass and compare with the theoretical predictions, which are shown here in black. These are data, these are predictions. So the fact that data is matching predictions so well, it's very strong evidence that what we are selecting are actually TDEs. Now, of course, you must always be skeptical because some of these events were not selecting correctly, and that's for sure. In particular, this event that is shown here, it's a, it's a controversial event. It's called Assassin 15. It's a controversial event. But still, the fact that you are getting both the overall shape and the overall number well, and also the luminosity, the expected luminosity as well, tell you that these events are most likely to is that your selection process is working well to the order one level. No, it's 12 TDs. They are just binned. This one is one because it's very, it happened very far away, but these are 12 in total. If they, but they are just binned. They, they, the authors of this paper, they combine them in, in bins. Right, so in the, in the optical, we have a few dozens of these events. In the X-ray, we have a few dozens of events. And in the UA, we have a few of these events. And LSST is expected to observe 100,000. So the data set will go from order 100 to order 100,000 in a time scale of 10 years. So that's pretty exciting. And also, in the same way that in uh, some supernova, you end up triggering these things uh, through uh, mergers of stars. Yeah. Can you the same thing happen here? That's a good question. I don't know if they can trigger supernovas. What I do know is that they can trigger a process that's called a flare in an AGN. So there are processes 
that happen near supermassive black holes, which are also transient events, where you have a, an accretion disk, which is accreting into the black hole, but not a large amount of material, so that you don't see that AGN. It's believed that a process by, so, but what, what will happen is that the AGN has an instability, that at some point in time, it just accretes a lot. And it's not understood why that happens. And one possible hypothesis is that actually those events are triggered by TDEs. But those events are a very small number of the actual total number of TDE events. Uh, at, least, at least that's what uh, astronomers believe. And, and the reason is that we only have seen a few flaring events, while we have seen several dozens of TDE events. So they seem to be a, a small subcomponent of data. But in fact, towards the future, one of the worries of astronomers is how do we select TDEs that actually are at the same time triggering something in the AGN. But with regarding supernovas, I actually do not know if they can trigger supernovas. Now, why? So there are several handles that, so, so this thing is just walking like a dog, it's swimming like a dog, and it's quacking like a dog. And it's true that I cannot ensure you that all the events that have been selected are truthfully TDs, but they look like TDs and they have all the expectations that we have from TDs. So I, it, I think it's fair to say that a large fraction of the community already believes quite strongly that these events that we are seeing in the sky are TDs. Now, That is not uh, this prediction, right? Not really with anything else, because again, you are matching the overall well, rate. With, uh, with a straight line. But there's other plots that you can do. So here I'm plotting, for instance, against black hole mass. You can also plot TDs against luminosity. TDs, if you plot TDs against, so supernovas, for instance, are expected to have a wide distribution in luminosity. Some of them very being very super Eddington. If you plot TDs against luminosity, you will see that most TDs are are very close to Eddington or sub Eddington, while supernovas you expect them to be so, some of them super Eddington. So, and, and if you select these events, you plot the luminosity, you see that they have luminosities that are expected from TDEs and they do not really match the supernova hypothesis, for instance. So that's yet another cross check, cross -check that people has done in order to, to make sure that what you're doing makes sense, okay? But it's true that this, this event here, it's, it's actually, so TDE people, TDE believers, they will tell you that this is a TDE and that this is the stronger, the strongest of, uh, evidence in favor of the fact that these events are TDEs. I'm, I'm much more skeptical. I, I, I know that this event is in particular, uh, but, but there are more handles, okay? Now, but this cutoff here actually can be understood from first principles, okay? And the reason from this cutoff, for this cutoff at high black hole masses, it's one of the main things that will be of importance for us, okay? That cutoff happens because of the following. For very large black hole masses, the tidal radius for disruption falls within the horizon. If that happens, the star can get tidally disrupted, but only after entering the horizon. And if that happens, you see no flare because no light can exit the horizon, okay? So that's the origin of that cutoff. And we can understand that, understand that from the following. The tidal radius depends on the mass of the black hole to a very small power, while the horizon radius depends linearly with the black hole mass. So as you increase the black hole mass, the horizon radius grows very quickly, but the tidal radius doesn't change much. So if you keep increasing the black hole mass, at some point, the horizon radius will be larger than the tidal radius. So the TDE will happen inside the horizon. So that's why you have that cutoff in, uh, at high masses. You can calculate exactly what's the cutoff in mass at which you shouldn't see any more TDEs. And that cutoff in mass is roughly 10 to the eight solar masses for a non-spinning black hole. We'll go to the case of spinning black holes uh, momentarily. And that number here, 10 to the eight solar masses is called the Hills mass. TDEs cannot happen in supermassive black holes with masses larger than the Hills mass. However, I told you that TDEs depend sensitively on the near horizon geometry. And we know that the near horizon geometry is modified by spin. In particular, the horizon of a black hole is modified by, by black hole spin. That means that the, this Hills mass must depend on black hole spin. So we can calculate what's the Hills mass as a function of black hole spin. This was done by Keston in like roughly 15 years ago already, Michael Keston. So this is the Hills mass as a function of black hole spin, where spin is in dimensionless units. One is maximal black, uh, black hole spin. So here the a Hills mass for a non-spinning black hole is 10 to the 8 solar masses, as I told you. But as I increase the spin of the black hole, the Hills mass grows quite sharply. For a maximally spinning black hole, the Hills mass is roughly three to four times larger than for a non-spinning black hole. 
The reason of that is because if you make the black hole spin, the horizon shrinks. Therefore, it's more likely that the tidal radius will fall outside the horizon. Another way to interpret this plot is that in this parameter space, the um, all the gray region is a region where you cannot have observable TDs because the tidal radius falls within the horizon. And all the white region is where you can have observable TDs. That's yet another way to interpret this plot. Given that the cutoff depends on the spin of the black hole, that means that the TD rates per galaxy also must depend on the spin of the black hole. And this has been calculated in the literature. And here I'm showing you the TD rates per galaxy per year for different spins of supermassive black holes. So for a non-spinning black hole, we see that the rates are non-zero up to the Hill's mass, 10 to the 8 solar mass essentially. But for spinning black holes, a whole decade essentially in parameter space of black hole mass opens up for you to have observable TDs, OK? So this cutoff um, changes a lot. And the modification of the spin on the TD rates, it's dramatic. It's not a small effect. If you take the TD rates here for a largely spinning black hole versus non-spinning black hole, the effect is super exponential. Okay, so the, the effect is quite dramatic. Now then the question is, what are the spins of supermassive black holes? And we don't know that. So from theory, we expect supermassive black holes to have a sizable spin because they grow from accretion, but it's actually not known very well. So there's not a very robust data that tells us what's the spin distribution of supermassive black holes, but they are believed to have large spins, to be born with large spins, okay? In, at least in, in several theoretical models. So let's now provide the connection with DSM physics. Now, in addition, if we have ultralight bosons that exist in nature, we know that they affect spins of supermassive black holes very effectively by the supervariant instability. And this will leave very unique imprints in the TDE rates that I just showed you. So let me now review what's the supervariant instability for you in case you're not familiar with it, okay? So the supervariant instability is the fact that a spinning supermassive black hole if ultralight actions exist in nature, they don't have to be dark matter, nothing, they just need to be part of your Lagrangian. A spinning supermassive black hole will spin down by exponentially growing a bosonic cloud around it, a cloud made of, out of these ultralight bosons. So this bosonic cloud extracts the, spins, the, the spin of the black hole. You can think of this bosonic cloud as a hydrogen atom where with the typical hydrogen, hydrogenic atom levels where each level is populated by an exponentially large number of ultralight bosons. There's a condition for, the, for super radiance to happen. And the condition is essentially that the mass of your ultralight boson needs to be smaller than the angular velocity of the black hole. And these, these clouds are hydrogenic, so they have angular momentum. For instance, they have an angular momentum along the C direction, which goes from minus L to L, just like in the hydrogen atom, okay? Now, there's a crucial quantity that controls how fast does this cloud grow and controls most of the dynamics of this cloud. That quantity is called the gravitational coupling. It's, it plays the role of the fine structure constant of this hydrogen atom. It's given by the mass of the black hole times the mass of the axon times G Newton. So it's a dimensionless quantity. So it's, just, it's exactly like a fine structure constant of this atom. And thinking in terms of this fine structure constant allow us to carry out our intuition from the hydrogen atom. For instance, the radius of this cloud is just given by one over the fine structure constant, sorry, well, N squared, where N is the principal, angular, the principal number of the hydrogen atom divided by the fine structure constant multiplied here by the mass of your axon. So that's exactly like in the hydrogen atom. Oops. And also the condition for superradiance to happen for maximally spinning black holes takes a very simple form, a form for maximally spinning black holes, tells you that the superradiance happens only for fine structure constants, roughly less than 0.5 for m equals one, okay? So that's nice. So it, there's this, this parameter seems to be very useful. Now, from this condition, you will naively expect then that it's better to have very small fine structure constant for you to satisfy the condition and grow the cloud. But of course, that's not right because if you take this coupling to be small, then the gravitational coupling of your particle goes to zero. Therefore, this effect must disappear. And that's actually captured by the fact that the super radiant rates scale down with alpha very strongly as you decrease the fine structure constant. In other words, the time scale for you to grow the cloud becomes ex becomes extremely large if you decrease this parameter a lot. You can calculate what's the time scale to, to grow these clouds and extract spin from the black hole. For both ultralight bosons that are vectors or scalars like dark photons or axions, and the time scale for dark photons 
to grow a cloud is roughly 100 years for typical parameters in a supermassive black hole, while, while for us axons is roughly 10 to the six years. Both these time scales are much smaller than the lifetime of, of a typical supermassive black hole. So you do extract spin very efficiently if you have these particles in your Lagrangian. Now, as a consequence, it's good to have large gravitational coping so that you decrease these time scales and you, you can grow these clouds within the age of the universe, say, but you don't want to make this alpha too large because otherwise you stop fulfilling the super radiant conditions. So the sweet spot is to have an alpha that is moderate. And if you translate this back into parameters of your original Lagrangian, this will tell you that for super radiance to happen efficiently, the mass of your axion or dark photon needs to roughly match the inverse size of your supermassive black hole. Okay. Sorry, a naive question. Why is it between the two, is it because the scalars need to go to some higher orbital, like some P, yeah. to, to extract angular moment, or is there another reason? The reason is that the vector, so superradiant clouds only are superradiant if they have positive angular momentum along the C direction. So vectors, in addition of having orbital angular momentum, can have spin. Scalars only can have positive orbital angular momentum. So if you, so vectors have the possibility of having no orbital angular momentum and then only spin. In that case, there's no angular momentum barrier for them to get close to the black hole. Therefore, super radiance is more efficient because it happens close to the horizon. So that's the intuition on why vectors are much faster. So given that you, you have these ultralight bosons, you can calculate how much spin do they extract from supermassive black holes. Here, I calculated how much spin did it extract from a supermassive black hole for three different action masses and taking scalar spin zero bosons, not dark photons, spin zero bosons. And I'm calculating how much spin do you extract for different masses of the black hole. And there are different features in this plot. So consider, take the case of the red curve, which corresponds to this mass here. So the first thing that you realize is that these scalars can extract a large amount of spin of the black hole. So if you start with spin one, it can extract spin down to spins of like essentially 0.6. So you can extract an order one amount of the spin of the black hole. That's the first thing that you realize. The second thing is that for a fixed action mass, if you move towards larger black hole mass, that means larger gravitational coupling, the spin extraction becomes less efficient. And the reason is that if you go towards larger gravitational coupling, then the super radiance condition is only fulfilled for larger spins. Therefore, you can only extract spin up to larger spins. On the left hand of the plot, you are going towards lower supermassive black holes, which means smaller gravitational coupling, and super radiance becomes slower. And if there's a competing effect that spins up the black hole, such as an efficient disk, then super radiance cannot counteract that effect. So the spin extraction also becomes smaller. So that's why this, these curves here have these funny shapes. And there's an optimal black hole mass for a fixed action mass for which you extract the maximal spin, okay? Now note that if you, this is all assuming that your black hole started with spin one. Say that your black hole started with spin 0 0.4, then there's nothing that super radiance can do. In other words, super radiance in order is only an observable effect if you allow me to have supermassive black holes that have large spin to start with. Otherwise, you just don't see super radiance. And this is a generic effect of super radiance, not only of, of just our proposal, okay? So that's a crash course to super radiance. And now we're ready to understand what's the relation with stellar TDEs, okay? So let's see how light bosons affect TDE event rates. The easiest way to understand how they affect TDE rates is by going back to this Hills mass plot, okay? So here I was showing you in gray, the Hills mass as a function of the spin of the supermassive black hole and the mass of the supermassive black hole. So again, for non-spinning black holes, we know that the Hills mass is 10 to the eight solar masses. For highly spinning black holes, we know that the Hills mass is essentially 10 to the nine solar masses. So TDEs for largely spinning black holes can only happen if the black hole has mass less than 10 to the nine solar masses. However, now we also have these axions. So consider the case of putting in axions with this mass in here in particular, so the blue curve. Those axions will extract spin from the black hole. That's shown here in blue. So therefore, they will forbid all this region of parameter space in blue, which was previously allowed. Therefore, these Hills masses that were here are not allowed anymore. And now you can see by eye, what's the maximum black hole mass that can lead to the TDE. So what's the maximal Hills mass that you see in this plot is shown here in this star. So the existence of this action, the action decreased the effective Hills mass. 
So essentially what it's doing, it's even though before you could have TDEs for supermassive black holes up to masses of 10 to the nine solar masses, because you could have largely spin black holes, the fact that you have an action that extracts the black hole, so that decreases the effective Hill's mass down to this point here, which is now like two times 10 to the X solar masses. So in other words, the existence of ultralight bosons creates an effective Hill's mass, which is smaller than the Hill's mass in the absence of the axons. So that affects the, so we can calculate this effective Hill's mass as a function of the boson. Here I'm doing it for spin zero bosons. It's shown here. So in gray, I'm showing you the Hill's mass for a large, for a maximally spinning black hole. And here in blue, I'm showing you the same Hill's mass, but now in the presence of the axions. So you see that it has a dramatic, well, quite dramatic effect on the Hill's mass. It's an order of few effect on the Hill's mass. And these fingers in this plot come from the fact that there are different atomic levels in the super radiant cloud, M equals one, two, and three. So that means that axions affect stellar tidal disruption event rates because they decrease the effective cutoff. So we can calculate what are the TDD rates now in presence of the axions. So again, I'm doing just spin zero particles, not vectors. I will come back to vectors uh, later on. And here in black, I'm showing you TDD rates per galaxy per year in the absence of the axion for a maximally spinning black hole. And in these different colors, I'm showing you TDD rates in the presence of these axions. So there are two things to see in this plot. First of all, that the axions clearly affect the TDD rates quite dramatically. So for instance, if you take this uh, blue curve here, which is this axion mass here, you see that the existence of this action in nature will essentially cut off TDE rates for everything above 10 to the 8 solar masses. So if you see a TDE event at larger black hole masses, that will be in contradiction with the existence of an action with this particular mass. Another uh, feature that you see is that these curves are not like smooth. They have all these funny features here. And those come again from the fact that you extract spin in different levels of this atomic cloud, M equals one, M equals two, M equals three. But the overall message is that the existence of these axions is getting very, very, very clearly imprinted in TDE rates that you can measure in data. Yep that uh, has nothing to do with the abundance of these actions, it's just the existence, it's not, uh, okay. As long as they have a mass and they don't have large salt interactions, because they have large salt interactions, then the cloud actually collapses. But if, as long as they have a mass and they are in the Lagrangian, that's it. They don't need to be dark matter, nothing. <laughs> feature because you, you assume in this case one supermassive black hole is one value of, of its spin. But the observation from many supermassive black holes so of bring there. Yes, I will I will go back to that. Okay. So I will go back to that in particular regards to the uncertainties of black hole masses, but there are also uncertainties in just what are the initial black hole spins. I will not go back to that. I'm assuming for the rest of this talk that supermassive black holes in the absence of actions have sizable spins. They don't need to be one, but say 0.9, something like that, okay? Which is actually consistent with, 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 with what we expect from theory. I can actually show you spin, a, a prospective spins from supermassive black holes from theoretical calculations, if, if you want there. Okay. I think you just answered my question. Absolutely, absolutely. Hope of trying to We, I, we will see, we will do it statistically. I will not need the measurement of the spin of the black hole and that's actually crucial. So that, that's great because then me measuring spins of black holes is infamously hard. So the conclusion is that the existence of these bosons leaves very unique signatures in TD rates. And as uh, Jeff already were, was um, um, previewing like, these tests do not require measuring the spin of the black hole. The only thing that I need to do is to count how many TDEs I observe in the sky. And if those are inconsistent with the existence of the axon, then I can rule out axons with particular masses. But there are significant uncertainties in, in, in that process, which I will show you some of them in the, in the next few slides. Okay, so how do we turn this into something realistic? So right now we have around say 50 TDEs that are in data, in X-ray and optical. That data set will increase by 
three to four orders of magnitude in the next 10 years. So it's a, it's, I mean, it's a revolution. These things are, it's like now you know all of this, all, all what I'm telling you about from, from 50 events, we'll have three to four orders of magnitude more events than what we have now. So we will know significantly more about it is in the next 10 years. So this is really exciting. And LSST will be the machine to do that. So LSST will or is expected to see around 10 to the 5 TDs selected in the optical. So what we need to do now is to calculate how many events does LSST expect to see in the presence and in the absence of actions to see what is the or or dark photons to see what is the reach to discover or rule out these particles. Okay. So in order to do that, we need several ingredients. First of all, we need the TD rate per galaxy that I already showed you in the previous slide. After that, we need to know how many supermassive black holes are in the universe per se megaparsec cube. Combining these two things, we can know how many TDEs do we expect per megaparsec cube in the universe. And if we also know what is the TD luminosity, then we can know in a magnitude limited sample, such as LSST, how many do we expect to see in our lens in our observatory, okay? So once we combine these three things, we can calculate the expected TD rate in a flux limited sample such as LSST. So let's do that. So the, the galactic TD rate I already showed you, it's clearly affected by axons and dark photons, but let's move to the second point, which is the volumetric density of supermassive black holes. So that can be taken from data. So people study how many black holes are there per megaparsec cubed as a function of redshift. This is a, the result from a particular paper from Aversa where they feed um, theoretical models to observations and, uh, and, they, and they get quite a close match. So that's roughly well understood. So how many supermassive black holes are there per megaparsec cubed? That's roughly well understood from data to the order one level, let's say. Regarding the TD luminosities, that's less well understood. So we know that they are close to Eddington in luminosity, but there's variability. Here I'm showing you an, a plot for the, for, of the black body luminosity of 12 optically selected TDs that I took from this particular reference here as a function of the mass of the dark hole that led to these 12 TDs, okay? So you see that the black body luminosity ranges from anything between 10 to the 43 hours per second to roughly 10 to the 46 hours per second. And the masses of the supermassive black holes that led to the TDE range from, from roughly 10 to the five solar masses for assassin 14 for this particular event to 10 to the eight solar masses for assassin 15. Assassin stands for all sky patrol of supernova events or something like that. But you see that there's a widespread of luminosities of roughly one to two orders of magnitude, uh, just depending on the event. But there seems to be an overall trend in data that TDEs that happen at higher black hole masses tend to be more luminous, okay? So just for simplicity, I will just interpolate between the TDE with lowest mass, lowest supermassive black hole mass and the highest supermassive black hole mass, I interpolate that to calculate the luminosity of a TDE. But I have also I have also taken different assumptions for this luminosity that I can show you if you wish. Okay, that's that was that's what were you going to ask? Yes. So I, I've taken different assumptions for the luminosity, and it's actually not very important for the final results. The reason why the exact luminosity is not very important for the final results is that the bounds in the end will not be statistically dominated in the other, on the other, and like on, on other words. If we have high luminosities, we will have a million TDEs in data. If we have low luminosity, we will have say 10,000 or 15 or 50,000 TDE events in data. So the number of the data, the, the size of the data set will be very, very large. So the errors will not be dominated by statistics. They will be dominated by systematics, essentially. Are, the event that you're counting, is it a TDE or not? And that's a systematic that it's, it's irreducible. And, and that's what will dominate the, uh, the uncertainties in the, in the limits. So that's why the luminosity doesn't matter very much. But for concreteness, I took that. I, I have taken other possibilities, okay? And then you set a magnitude cut on what LSST can see, 22.4 from, from uh, actually LSST papers in the red band. So you need to translate this using a temperature to the red band of LSST that can be done with filters that are available online. And then you get the TDE rate per um, unit black hole, the, the expected number of TDE events that LSST will see per logarithmic unit of black hole mass. And that's shown here by this curve. So you see that under these assumptions, the, first of all, the TD rates that you expect are roughly 100,000. 
So this is in logarithmic uh, units. So you multiply this number roughly by the logarithmic means that you have and you get the total TD rate, 100,000. I validated that against results from this collaboration here that calculated the expected TD rate for the case of, of course, no actions, just for the standard model case. And here in blue, red, and green, I'm showing you the TD rates that are expected to be seen at LSST as a function of the action masses for three action, uh, three masses, mass choices. And here for the case of the vector for dark photons, okay? So let's look at these plots a bit more in detail. So first of all, the first thing that we see is that these actions very sensitively affect the TD rates at high black hole masses. So that carries out from the fact that these TD rates are very sensitively affected by the spin extraction. So, and this is, of course, a statistical sense. So at, in this mass bin here, say from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9, you expect to see roughly 10, 1,000 to 10,000 events. But if this action here exists, you expect to see essentially zero. Okay, so the effect is, is quite dramatic. And for the vectors, the effect is even more dramatic. And the reason is that the super radiance spin extraction for vectors are much faster than for scalars, as uh, for the reasons that I just told to Rafael uh, a while ago. So superannuous is just much more efficient for vectors. Therefore, the effect that vectors have on TD rates is much, much more pronounced, okay? Now you can translate this into prospective limits, okay? And this is where uncertainties, which are unknown at this point because we still don't have the data set, enter. So here I'm showing you in gray, the regions of parameter space that could be excluded by measuring measurements of the TD rates, essentially. If you measure TD events here in the tail, that means that this action cannot exist. So therefore you can set limits. But in order for you to set limits, not only you need to account, take into account statistical uncertainties, which are small because we have a large number of events, but you need to take into account systematics. What are the systematics? The systematics come from the fact that you don't really exactly know what's a TD. You will see a flaring event in the sky. Sometimes maybe a TD, sometimes it can be a supernova. So you will make an error from that. Currently, we select TDs literally because there's people that look at events and they classify them by, by hand. This is a TDE, this is not, et cetera, by just measuring the properties of the event. But in the future, for LSST, since we'll expect 100,000 of these events, of course, we cannot have people there. There will be an algorithm selecting what's a TDE, what's a supernova, what's an AGN, what's a flaring AGN, et cetera. And that algorithm will have an error. Not always it will select correctly TDs. So there's a systematic from that in the right measurements. So in order to derive prospective limits, I took an arbitrary, well, it's not exactly arbitrary, that's rather arbitrarily 50% 50 systematic, which is a quite large error. So essentially I'm telling you that I, can, I need to get right one out of two TDs, okay? So it's a, I'm, I'm being very generous with this error. And uh, okay, and we can talk about that error later on, but that's, that's a bit arbitrary, but it's just to give you a sense on how much parameter space you can exclude. So that's shown here in gray, so in gray, you the num so if you see the number of events that you expect from the standard model, then that means that you can exclude the action because the action will suppress the rates at high masses. So then you will exclude actions with masses roughly between 10 to the minus 19 to a few times 10 to the minus 19 electron volts. So roughly a factor of five in action mass, not very impressive, but still pretty, pretty nice. And for vectors, the, the, the bounds are much, much more interesting. You can exclude essentially two orders of magnitude in parameter space by measuring TV rates, which is pretty cool. Now there are uncertainties on this. One of them I already showed you, we, we, can, we don't really know exactly what are TDs. So there will be a systematic in our counting from that. There's another uncertainty that comes from the fact that we don't really extremely precisely measure black hole masses. So these TDE event rates here, differential rates as a function of black hole mass, assuming essentially that you have a perfect measurement of the black hole mass, because these are just the continuous distributions. But in reality, you won't have that. You will measure your black hole mass with a large error. Currently, the errors that you have on the black hole mass measurements that correspond to a DDE are essentially one order of magnitude. So in, in reality, what you will have will be a beam distribution of events. So essentially, you will be able to divide these range of supermassive black hole masses, say in three beams, okay? And then you can recalculate everything, assuming that you have this beam distribution, which is more consistent with what you actually will see in data. So in black, you see the standard model prediction, and in blue and green and red, you see the predictions in the case when, when, you, when you have the actions. So you see that first of all, these very nice features here are washed out just because you don't have excel, excellent mass resolution, but 
still you see the effect of these, the, the presence of these axons on the DD rates on the tail. So it does look that even though this mass measurement will smear out these, these features here, the, the effect of this action seems to stay there. And how much will it stay there? It's a statistical question. And I, I don't have the answer for that because we don't have the measurements yet. We don't know exactly what are the uncertainties that we'll have on the supermassive black hole measurements, the, the, the measurements of the supermassive black hole masses, et cetera. But you see that at least assuming a one dex uncertainty in the mass of the black hole, by eye, you see the you see already the effect of these actions. For vectors, the effect, of course, is much more pronounced for the reasons that I was telling you before. So these two plots here are showing you if you have improvements in the measurements of the mass of the supermassive black holes, we can talk about them, but it's unlikely that you will have do much better than this, but at least it's likely that you will know exactly what are these uncertainties. Are they Gaussian, are they not Gaussian, et cetera. But we can talk about this later if you want. So I guess I still have one minute or two minutes. Do I have one minute? No. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's a, a colloquium online by GGI, so we should try aiming at stopping there. But I will stop here. Going. I, I will stop here, and and I will take questions. And if we still have time, I'll tell you because this is a gravitational wave week. I'll tell you the. Comp possible complementarity with Lisa, okay? But uh, I'll, I'll just stop here now. I just have a question. So first of all, I think I missed it. Uh, how did you fold in the assumptions for eight, the, the spins uh, distributions of black holes into the, into the calculation? Yeah, I'm assuming. And the second question oh, is how do your bounds and using numbers that are constrained on, on, on the axions and our photons in the same kind of parameter space? Yeah, so regarding the first question that was what's the assumption for the spins of the black holes. So here I'm assuming that spins of black holes are whatever it's larger than what superagents can extract. So the, the black curve, for instance, is assuming that the spin of the black hole is essentially maximal. That's just the standard model calculation. The supervariance effect will be there as long as the spin of the supermassive black holes are larger than what super supervariance can extract. Is, is that clear? Or for, for instance, like, yeah. Yes, exactly. Just because supervariance doesn't care about things if the spins are low to start with, right? Now the second uh, question is was uh, what was the question like the <laughs> the which... yeah sorry I can ask it again oh the, the spin uh... measurements okay so the spin measurements they claim to exclude parts of this parameter space let me just say two words about that first of all there's those those bounds are highly controversial and the reason is that the way in which you measure supermassive black hole spins, uh, they, they are two uh, methods, but for the, super, for the supermassive black holes, there's one that's called X-ray relativistic reflection. So that method relies on you exciting a particular line of iron in the accretion disk of the black hole, and then you measure the redshift of that line emission. And from that, you extract the size of the ISCO, the, 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 well, the, the ISCO of the, of the accretion disk. And from that, you extract the spin of the black hole. There are significant systematics in that, in that uh, process. So some people believe that these spin measurements are actually not extremely precise. My personal take on that is that they are not extremely precise, even though the experts, some experts will tell you that they are, some experts tell you that they want. But my particular uh, take on this is that given that those methods are extremely complicated, to me, they only make sense on a statistical sense. So right now we have very few data points, so there's no statistics that we can talk about. And secondly, they, they always need a complementary probe. The reason is that it's just a, a very complex method. So there's something that you may be messing up and this is where this will come in or vice versa, okay? So that's, that's, that will be my take on it. Hi. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, because I'm, I have to, every second year to to write the update of the of the particle data group axion review. I, of course, I like to have this everything to, to get finally in a plot, say one over F A versus mass, and then as as you said, uh, you are you are not so. 
your li limits or bounds will not be valid up to arbitrary large uh, uh, one over FA or arbitrary large uh, uh, self interaction uh, uh, things. So, uh, do you have intentions also to include this in your? So, so at, at the moment you 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 don't assume any self even interactions, but uh, yes, I. I do not, and the reason is that it's a very complicated problem. That problem though has been treated partially by a recent paper that you probably are aware of, Pari Akhtar et al. They put out a paper last year or this year about the uh, uh, bosonic superradiant clouds in the case of the axon or axon-like particles with self-interactions. There's a lot of new effects that happen once you turn on self-interactions, it's extremely complex. So that paper is very, very comprehensive. So that was already done. And I, I don't see a reason that why I should reproduce that. You could try to connect that with these particular measurements, but yeah, that's beyond the, that's beyond the scope. It, this is already, a, I, I have been working on this for a year and a half or two years. So this is already a tremendous amount of work. Then I, I, I haven't even showed you half of it. So, so it's, uh, it's enough for, me, for this particular thing. Yes, so Lisa, okay. So complementary with Lisa, complementarity with Lisa, which is not looking great, but still, uh, let me just say the, the idea, which is pretty cool. Just, okay, so Lisa is expected to see several extreme mass ratio in spirals from uh, just that star that goes close to the supermassive black holes. It, it just in spiral in, you have a merger and Lisa is expected to see that it's one of the main targets of Lisa. But what happens if you have a bosonic cloud in the supermassive black hole, okay? So this is a plot of the evolution of the orbit of a typical star close to the supermassive black hole. This is the semi-major axis, and this is the angular momentum of the star. When the semi-major axis is large, you see that the trajectory in this plane is very stochastic. And the reason for that is that when the semi-major axis is large, that means when the star is very far from the black hole, the evolution of the star towards the black hole is controlled not by the black hole, but by interactions between stars. But when the semi-major axis becomes small, that means the star approaches the black hole, then the gravitational pull of the black hole is the dominant thing. And at that point, the extreme mass ratio in spiral starts. And you see that this trajectory here is not very well seen. It turns out to be very, very smooth at small semi-major axis, okay? Now you can calculate what's the semi-major axis then at which the MRI starts. And that's roughly a milliparsec. You can calculate what's the frequency for that milliparsec, um, the, the, the orbital frequency of the in spiral at a milliparsec, okay? That orbital frequency in particular can match energy differences between the superradiant clouds. So the superradiant cloud is just like a hydrogen atom. It has energy differences. If that MRI frequency matches the energy differences in the cloud of the supermassive, in the bosonic cloud, it can excite uh, energy level transitions. For instance, it can excite level transitions from a positive angular momentum level to a negative angular momentum level. So that means that the cloud loses angular momentum. That angular momentum goes somewhere and it goes to the star. So then the, the, the way to understand this is that the star comes in, then you excite this level transition. There's a significant amount of angular momentum change in this cloud, that momentum goes to the star, the, the star gets ejected. If that's the case, you do not have any extreme mass ratio in spirals at Lisa because the star just never goes close enough to the black hole so that you will see the gravitational wave from Lisa, okay? You can calculate for which parameters does this happen that you quench the extreme mass ratio in spiral rate that you will observe at Lisa in the case of the existence of a superradiant cloud. And I have calculated for several types, for several types of transitions. From the, this is the principal angular momentum number in some notation. This is L, this is M. So I calculated the transitions from M equals one to M equals minus one. And that requires the fine structure constant to be la larger than 0.4. And you will have these resonant transitions that will kick out stars. So you won't have MRIs. I calculated also for this particular transition and this one. And there are different conditions that different transitions between this hydrogen atom level impose, okay? So there are different regions of parameter space for which you can actually have like this ping ball effect that the, the MRI wants to start, but it just gets ejected. So what will be the ideal situation? The ideal situation will be that at uh, LSST, you will see a quenching of the rate for TD events in say in 2020 from 2030, then 2035, Lisa turns on or something. And you see at the same time a quenching on the MRI rate. 
Okay, but that only happens for a particular set of fine structure constants. So it's only a subset of parameter space. That will be the, the, the ideal situation. It's, it's a cross check of what you did from 2020 to 2030. The problem is that it, this happens, okay? So this fact that you kick out MRIs and you quench the MRI rate happens in supervariance. But the problem is that LISA is sensitive, it, it, in my understanding, to MRIs where the sum of the masses is roughly between 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7 solar masses. But for my case, for TDEs, all the effects are happening at 10 to the 8 solar masses. So it's not right quite the same. <laughs> so there, there's the comp maybe there's a bit of complementarity, like tiny regions of primary space, but not much. But still, this effect is interesting. And I don't think it has been in, like studied in detail. 